Gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Boca Photography Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz. Uh, apologize for the uh, slight delay in getting started here today. I had to address some technical issues. I guess typical Monday, right? Happy Monday to those of you that are live streaming with us and um, glad to have you here. And don't be shy as we get into this conversation today to ask questions, to comment, to join the conversation at hand. That is one of the benefits of these live streams is that you can, of course, ask our guests questions. You can share your own experiences as it relates, as it relates to the topic and ultimately be, able to be part of the conversation. For those of you that are not live streaming with us, as I always say, make sure to follow us at Boca Podcast, B-O-K-E-H Podcast on Instagram and pretty much everywhere else on social media. And um, also come be part of the conversation. We share the upcoming live stream schedule there on Instagram. So make sure to follow us if you aren't already. And on that note, I wanna go ahead and introduce a brand new guest on the Boca Podcast today. Jeff Brown is here with me. Jeff, thank you so much for being willing to do the show. I really, really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Well, and, and I told you before we got started, I, I, you know, it's, it's easy. I think when we listen to media in, in any form or watch media, it's easy to assume that what hosts are saying or what guests are saying is just kind of cliche. They just throw out typical lines like, I'm so excited to be on the show, you know, this, this kind of thing. And, and I told yeah. you before we got started, I said, I want you to know, so I'm not just kind of feeding, feeding you a line or feeding the audience a line. I'm genuinely excited about this topic today. We're going to be talking about how to more effectively convert customers that land on our website to customers, or excuse me, visitors to customers. And um, we'll get into that topic here in just a second. But for anybody listening in or watching who doesn't know who you are, I would wonder if you just briefly introduce yourself and your brand for us. Yeah, so, so my name is Jeff Brown, and I'm a photographer's mentor based in the UK. Uh, I'm a, also a best-selling photography business author. I have three books out, uh, The Photographer's Missing Link, which is a guide to LinkedIn. Uh, the Ambitious Photographer's Journal, which is a goal setting and uh, success journal and new re newly released the uh, Help My Photography website needs more customers, which is part of what we're going to be talking about today. And I work with photographers in over 20 countries worldwide. I'm a photographer myself, although I have just retired from actively photographing. And I used to be a military photographer, so I served 10 years with the Royal Navy as a, uh, I was a military photographer. Well, and I appreciate you, ex you sharing your experience as a photographer, too. That's always important to me. Anytime we have uh, guests on the show who may be in the educational space, I like to give our listeners context as well uh, as to the photography background. You, you mentioned to me before we got started that you photographed over 700 weddings and, and thousands of boudoir sessions. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So, so like I said, my, my original job was a, a military photographer. So I started out as a military photographer. And when you come to leave the military, you get what's called in the UK resettlement money. So it's money to give you back to go and be a civilian again. So that was quite a bit of money, seven and a half thousand pounds. But what I did with that money is I didn't uh, spend it on photography training because military photographers are fairly well trained anyway. I spent that money on branding and marketing training. And then mm. six months later, my business partner, Kev DeRoche, who was also a military photographer, uh, he left six months after me because he, he didn't want to come straight out. He wanted uh, to see how it went because he had he had kids. He, had a, he was married. I, I wasn't and I didn't have kids. So I took the risk. So when he came out, we had another seven and a half thousand pounds to spend on marketing and branding. And the funny thing was, we, we built within 18 months, we built an eight figure, a six figure uh, wedding, wedding photography business, then went on to open a commercial photography business, a boudoir business and a nursery school and kindergarten business and eventually a photography training business. At that time, I would say we were probably the least experienced wedding photographers, but it only took us 18 months to really take over our geographical area. And that wasn't because we were amazing photographers. It was because we had the right branding and marketing skills. Mm -hmm. Those were the really important things. You know, it was getting the brand and the brand message out because our customers are consumers. They're not photographers. So when you market to your customers, you're marketing to a consumer. You're not selling photographs. You're not selling aperture and shutter speed and depth of field. You need to communicate effectively as a marketeer to a consumer, to a customer not as if you sell into another photographer, which most photographers actually try and do. It's such, I mean, we could literally stop the podcast episode right here and all of our listeners would walk away with so much value if they actually realize mm -hmm. the significance of what you just said, because you're absolutely right. The, the kind of cute cliche phrases that you see on thousands of photographers' websites that are really a reflection of photographers speaking to photographers, um, it, they're just not nearly as effective as if we use the language relevant to our target market, which is the consumer market, as, as you talked about, 
photographers get caught up in, in all the, the photography speak and the technical side of things. And unfortunately, yeah. that seems to spill over onto websites as well. And so, again, there's opportunity to, to address that. And we're going to talk about that today. I, I appreciate you sharing that perspective because it really is absolutely so important. I, I want to this podcast is largely about helping photographers build sustainable businesses. Right. So. We certainly have to put a lot of hard work in, but I think we should also work intelligently and efficiently so that we don't get burnt out in the process. And I'm curious, just as a, as a concept, especially with your experience as a photographer for so many years, what's a, an idea, a suggestion, a principle that you would recommend to our listeners that help them work a little bit more efficiently in their day-to-day -day business? I think one of the things to do is, you know, we sit and create um, to-do lists and and goals and stuff like that and we write them down every year and effectively we don't really do anything about them now I, I wrote a book called the ambitious photographers journal because i knew this was a real problem for photographers and i what i do is i look at goals from the bigger picture so d i always say do a goal or do a task that um creates multiple benefits so i'm actually doing one now so so one of my tasks for 2023 is to to get on to at least 30 photography podcasts to talk about websites because I want to really change the way photographers utilize their websites. Mm. Now, most photographers will set a financial goal. So they'll say, I want to make $100,000 or 100,000 pounds this year. If you try and chase the money, it doesn't work. Tr chase something else, change a, a strategic goal that you can put in. So what I know that when I do 30 podcasts, my social media will grow massively the number of opportunities that will come from that podcast itself as in to write in magazines ambassadorships uh, speaking events those will come as well and a byproduct of doing the podcast will be a financial result because i will get new customers i will get people working with me so i'm not chasing the money i'm chasing something else so look at opportunities there's so much opportunity out there available to us now more than we've ever had and you just have to reach out. So if you're a wedding photographer, why not look at creating some joint ventures with bridal shops? You know, set yourself a goal this year, I'm gonna create five joint ventures with bridal shops. Those joint ventures will help grow your social media because you'll get the, the followers from the bridal shops. It will help grow your customers. It will help grow your brand. Don't just set yourself a financial goal. Go for bigger. I love that. I love that. We talk quite a bit here on the show about the idea of a big picture view, an overarching set of goals uh, and values that kind of drive what we do, not, not just as business owners, starting with our personal life and how that should yeah. then spill over to the business and that should drive what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the things that caught my attention about what you said too is that not just simply don't focus on the financial, uh, focus on something bigger than that, but, but what you described was helping address a larger issue in the photography industry so what you're doing is, is ultimately an, an effort at adding value to making a difference in the lives of photographers, uh, which has a much deeper seated meaning than just simply having you know, a, a figure goal, a, a money goal, mm -hmm. as you were describing. And, yeah. and I love that because that not only enables a more sustainable effort, but it makes for a more fulfilling experience as business owners as well. Totally. And you know what I think from, um, especially when it comes to social media posting, and if you look, I'm, I'm quite active on social media, probably have over 100,000 followers across my different platforms. Uh, LinkedIn is one of the, the channels that I'm very active on. And you'd be very, very hard pushed to find any sales posts. I maybe do two or three sales posts a year when I do, when I do a, a new book launch. Um, but I don't do posts going, you know, come and work with me uh, or, or special offer on my mentoring program, anything like that. What I do is I help, I motivate and I inspire. And I also share personal content as well. So people see the person behind the brand and the business. And it comes down to that old thing that, you know, people buy from people who they know, like and trust. And if you want to build relationships, don't sell. Inspire people, give value, be in the news feed, be seen. Then all the good stuff just comes naturally. You don't have to to do sales posts to get it. You know, I get so much opportunity, but people just dropping me a message and saying, Jeff, I'd love to speak to you. I love what you do. And I've never once have I tried to sell. It actually makes you more saleable when you don't try to sell than when you do try to sell. Yeah, when people see that you are genuine, one, and then two are genuinely adding value, yeah, the rest mm. does seem to follow. And I, and I love that. There's a book uh, that Gary Vaynerchuk wrote a number of years ago called Jab, 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 Right Hook. And it's all that the premise is exactly that add value, add value, add value, and then sell. 
and then go right back to adding value and adding value and adding value again. That's the, that's the focus. That's the priority. I love that. Uh, Larry chimes in from YouTube. He says, I just listened to another podcast with Jeff, uh, hair of the dog. Great to be here today. Thanks for joining us, Larry. I appreciate that. And for the rest of you that are live streaming, don't be shy, comment, say hello, uh, ask questions along the way. We're going to keep this moving because we have a lot to talk about. Uh, when we talk about, uh, running a business efficiency of course enables sustainability but the other thing too that i think is really important is a, a big idea principle that enables growth this is something that, that i like to kind of get the perspective from established experienced photographers like yourself jeff um, who have been there done that is there a big idea or principle i mean you just shared a big one of course the focus on adding value maybe another big mm -hmm. idea that helped um, enable the kind of growth that you saw in your photography business I think one of the other things now, because obviously it, it, it's changed quite a bit since when I when I first started out, you know, back in 2000 and 2002. But I, one thing I ask my photographers to, to do and the people I work with is think outside the box, think the bigger picture and start to think of potentially developing your own passive income stream as a photographer. Now, that can be multiple things. You can create your own podcast. You can write a book. You can run an online course. Um, you can have a, um, you know, like a, a private Facebook group that is monetized. Now, when you have these sort of things, what that does is it brings authority and it brings credibility for you. And it also brings passive income. One of the biggest things I've done and, and, and I first did five years ago was write my first ever book. When I look at my first ever book, which only had 49 pages, it's quite embarrassing. But <laughs> that actually did that did bring me 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 money. And now, you know, now I've got three best selling books. It doesn't make me a million, but those books themselves bring me in hundreds of thousands of pounds of opportunity and revenue every single year. So it's not the book itself that brings in the huge amounts of money. It you know probably does enough money for for two or three really nice holidays a year, but the book creates, it positions me as somebody who's credible. It gives me that little bit of authority and then leads to a lot more opportunity. So I have, you know, one of my photographers who I've just, who uh, recently helped launch her book and she's a food photographer and she's written a food photographer's journal. Uh, I have a, another food photographer who's written a, a course and launched a course on how to take great photographs of food if you're a restaurant owner or front of house person in a, in a hotel. And he sells that course online so it creates money while he's asleep. You know, you can, you can, depending on whatever your niche is, you can create content for your other photographers or you can create content for your customers. So if you're a portrait photographer, you can create a course on how to take great pictures of your kids or you can create a course on how to set up a successful photography business. You know, after what happened in 2020, you know, when everything shut down, we need to be able to look at passive income streams. This needs to be one of your goals. It might not happen till next year, the year after, but have that. Think about it now. Think outside the box. What can I do? How can I utilize my skills and knowledge to position myself as an authority and more credible on the platform, but also earn myself some extra money? Even writing blogs. I write blogs for a few, a few big blogs and I get paid for writing those blogs. But when I write that blog, I also get more followers. I get more inquiries. I get more credibility. So it's all about looking, standing out because all your other competition won't be doing that. They'll all be just going through the mundane same stuff every week of building the business, posting to social media, but not thinking outside the box. Now, I guess the only area I'd push that back in is that in the last few years, it's become very popular to talk about this idea of passive income and, and getting into education, for example. I mean, it just seems like yeah. everywhere I look, left and right, there are photographers offering an educational course. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, Jeff, and, and you have experience in this realm too, so I'm curious, how do you yeah. recommend that photographers avoid just becoming a cliche, doing the same thing that, I mean, certainly percentage-wise, there are not a lot of photographers yeah. offering education, but it's become so much more popular and the number of people reaching out to me saying, hey, can I be on your show? I've got this course I'm going to promote or this education thing mm -hmm. or whatever. It's, it's become a lot more widespread. How do you avoid getting lost in the mix and, and then not standing out as a result? I think by being super niche, by having something or doing something that your, your competitors aren't doing. So I, I've got a, a brand and photographer I work with. Um, and she's, she's an ex-school teacher. So she's really good at the English language. So she's she's combined that with her photography skills and she's just launched, launched a course on how to create 
um, storytelling posts to accompany your images on, on, on LinkedIn. So it's all about the power of brand storytelling. So she, she's educating people from a photographer's point of view how to create beautiful images, but also create the content to go with it. Because yes, yeah. images stop the news feed, but then she's educating on how to, how to speak and how to communicate with her clients. So if you've got other skills, then you know, tailor those other skills into your offering. Yeah, leverage those. And I, and I like the recommendation of specificity because you're absolutely right. I think a lot of photographers, I mean, it's speaking of cliche, the cliche thing to do these days is, is somehow build the phrase six-figure photographer into whatever course is being offered. Yeah, yeah. And, and like that's, that's gr a great idea, but when everybody is saying that, then again, you get kind of lost in the mix. So specificity mm -hmm. is, is hugely important. Let's go ahead and transition to the conversation, though, about websites. And, and there is a tendency that photographers have, we've kind of alluded to it already, in our industry to focus on, on the creative, on the cute, um, on you know, just pretty pictures, but not so much thinking about setting their website up for the sake of conversion. And I'm curious, mm -hmm. why do you think that is? I mean, what, what in our kind of relatively short history of, of at least the modern wedding and portrait photography industry has led to this place where photographers are not thinking enough about conversion? Well, it, I think it's what happens is photographers tend to, you know, when somebody gets into photography and maybe starts as a hobby, they tend to go and look at their, this is a big fault I say with you know, photographers, is we go and look at our competitors or what we think of as our competitors. And quite often people who are below us in the, in where we love to be in our financial rewards, you know, so we look at, what everybody else is doing so photographers websites have become very very you know very much the same the, the, the portfolio style websites so they don't communicate anything they don't have a call to action they predominantly have a home page that maybe has a logo uh, a couple of words on, on the headline but doesn't say what they do but ultimately doesn't give the solution to the client and then it's just a gallery of images now no other um industry does that if you went to um, a car dealership, right, and you wanted to buy a new Ford or you wanted to buy a new Jaguar, and yeah. you went to their website and it says, we sell cars at the top, and it was a, a Jaguar logo, and then just had loads of pictures of cars and a contact page, you'd be like, um, well, what does it do? What's yeah. its not a 60? What's its top speed? What's its miles per gallon? Mm. Does it, What features does it have? You know. If you went to a hotel and you went to book on a hotel and all it had was pretty pictures and it said the most exclusive hotel in New York and that was it and nothing else and a contact page, you'd be really infuriated. You want to know what time they open, do they serve breakfast, does it have a spa, are dogs allowed, you know, how much are the rooms, all these, all these ideas and things that customers are searching for when they come to a website. As photographers, we just avoid and we think, oh, well, we'll put some pretty pictures up there and people will come to the website and go, oh, wow, they're amazing. I want to book that person. That's not how it works. Mm. Our customers can't tell the difference between your photos and somebody else's photos who has probably the same skill preferences, skill abilities as you, because our customers are consumers, they're not photographers. Isn't it? So what they're looking for they're looking for a solution to a need. They're looking to have their questions answered. But one of the big things they're looking for is an attractive brand because we are all brand experts. I'm a brand expert. You're a brand expert because we've all been branded to ever since we were kids. We know what fonts look sophisticated. We know what colors work with certain brands. But for some reason, we don't look at it deeply into our own websites. And if, for example, you're a wedding photographer, you shouldn't be looking at other wedding photographers you should be looking at the bridal magazines, the high-end wedding venues that every bride wants to go to, that, you know, some of the really fancy wedding dress shops. And you'll notice these brands have a particular style of font, a style of message, uh, colours that they use. Now, these brands have probably spent hundreds of thousands on brand research and marketing, whereas the photographer down the street whose website you've just had a look up has probably got his logo done on Fiverr for $20.00. And that's it. That's his level of branding and marketing research. Go for the people who are already serving your ideal client type and see how their website appears. Because if something looks premium, a person will pay more money for it. Remember, price only comes down to perceived value. And perceived value isn't in the product itself. Perceived value is in the, in the, in the external factors, the way it's packaged up and the way it's marketed to. Mm. A Jaguar car is no different than a Ford car underneath the bonnet you know mm. it, it has all the same 
working parts to make it move, but we'll play a lot more for Jaguar than we would for Ford. Like of Tiffany's, I bought my girlfriend a Tiffany's necklace for Christmas. Their, their service was first class, everything about it oozed quality. But when I looked at what I'd paid for, I was like, my God, that's really small. She was over the moon with it. Yeah. But it's, you know, there's probably not 600 pounds worth of silver in that tiny little necklace. <laughs> <laughs> so it, but the perceived value to her is really, really high. Hmm. And that, that is all done with the external factors, which is the brand. Well, I, but I, I want to come back to the original point you made, because as you're describing, that's why I was smiling too, as you're describing somebody going to a car website, like a Ford or Jaguar website, and, and all they saw was just a bunch of pretty pictures, they might even appreciate the pretty pictures, but the problem is they don't know, number one, how this is going to meet their needs or desires, and number two, they don't know what to do next. And it's yeah. it's so easy as photographers to forget about those components as, as we've discussed. And so we're going to talk about how to address those things. You mentioned to me beforehand that you've got kind of five big ideas that will drive the ability for photographers to improve conversion on their website. Um, I'm as usual, I've got my notebook here. I'm going to take notes as yeah. you're talking and would love for you to share that before you do. Carrie just chimed in from uh, Facebook a couple of minutes ago. She said this is such a good conversation. And, and absolutely, I would agree, Carrie. And uh, I really, Thank truly, you. Jeff, I appreciate the very practical advice already. And let's continue that now with these five principles that will help photographers drive or improve conversion. So one of the one of the first things you should do is your website should have one single purpose and then a backup purpose. So if somebody comes to your website, what do you want them to do? Now, if my own website, my mentoring website uh, the photographer's mentor.com if you go there there's one purpose on that website and that is to get you to book a free 30 minute advice call with me and um, because my mentoring package is just under two thousand pound nobody is going to go to my website and click buy now without first speaking to me so if you're a wedding photographer you're probably going to have what i call a high ticket to purchase so you need to get somebody to do something in order for them to, the next step is making the purchase. So the first per, per, um, the first thing you need to be doing on that website is to get in somebody to book, to have a consultation. You don't wanna be selling direct from your homepage. If you're a portrait photographer or headshot photographer, you might decide that the, the, the call to action on your homepage is to, is to schedule your session because it's a lot, it's a lot smaller ticket item. So your first call to action is to get somebody to do something. The whole purpose of that website is to direct people to eventually schedule this consultation with you to to plan out their wedding day to find out more about your services and how you would cater for their wedding day that becomes the call to action the secondary call to action is for them to leave their email address and that could be in exchange for a voucher so you could say you know join my vip mailing list on my vit my vip bridal club and get a hundred dollar voucher to use off the cost of any album packages don't ask them to subscribe to my newsletter or mailing list because that sounds really weak. It's not very exciting. But if you're gonna have a pop-up, get a pop-up to come on after 45 seconds, not the minute they land on the homepage. It's so annoying because when it happens that way. <laughs> it, exactly, it's totally annoying. However, if somebody's been on there for 45 seconds, then they're quite invested. They've, been, they've read quite a bit of your homepage, they're hanging around, so that, that 100 pound voucher might just be enough for them to go, I tell you what, I'm gonna leave my email address. Because people can do one of four things when they come to your website. They can call you direct if there's a call direct number there. They can book or schedule a consultation with you. They can make a direct purchase, which is you know book, buy a print online or buy a voucher for a portrait session, or they can leave their email address. The only other possible thing somebody can do when they come to your website, if they haven't done one of those four things, is hit that back button and go. And that's what happens so often because you're not prompting people to do it. If they hit the back button and they've gone and they haven't taken one of those four actions, if they haven't called you, scheduled a call, made a direct purchase or left their email address, you've lost them. They've gone and you've got no way of getting them back. The purpose of your website is to get one of those four things. If you can't get them to schedule a consultation call, at least get their email address in exchange for a voucher so you can hit them up later in the week with a follow-up email and try and build that relationship with them. And as far as 
what to, and, and I'm, I'm taking notes here. It, when we talk about this one single purpose and then a backup purpose, scheduling a call, maybe being the primary purpose and then the, the backup yeah. purpose, capturing their email. Will those so-called purposes vary depending on the business model or is it going to be the same most of the time for most photographers? No, if it, I, I normally say if, you know, if it's less than, you know, a few hundred dollars, a few hundred pounds, if it's, if it's a, if it's maybe like a portrait session or a pet portrait session, you might be able to just get somebody to, to book the session there and then. So I have a lot of headshot photographers I work with who they just have a, a link on their, on their homepage that schedule, it takes people to their online diary so they can, they can book in and book their headshot session. But the website needs to communicate communicate the benefits and the value of what you actually do and this leads on to sort of tip number two which yeah. is communicating the benefits selling the benefits your imagery brings and not selling the photography itself keep going i'm taking notes communicate the benefits right. so what, what, is, what so, is so yeah what does that look like for photographers because again the tendency is like you said just to kind of share some pretty pictures uh, that something we haven't talked about yet, but it's super popular is talk about themselves. That there's endless paragraphs of information and you know cute pictures sitting next to a, a window with drinking coffee or whatever it might be. Yeah. But this in no way no way communicates the benefit of the service that they offer. Mm -hmm. um, so how do they go about doing that? So so you've got to re uh, think about what what um, what category your photography falls into. So photography can only fall into two categories of um, what I call a, a sale. And that is an emotional based sale or a solution based sale. So emotional based sales are sales such as wedding photography, pet photography, portrait photography, boudoir photography. Solution based sales are such as commercial photography, food photography, personal branding, headshots. People are buying that, those sort of uh, services in solu as a solution to a need. So if, you, if you're buying a headshot, you don't just think, oh, I need a pretty picture. You, you're thinking... I need to look more professional. I need to yeah. grow my LinkedIn profiles. I need to get more engagement on my social media. I want to I wanna look the go-to person. So when you're a headshot photographer, you don't say, come and get a great picture. You say, come and make the perfect first impression. Come and be seen as the go-to person in your yeah. niche. You know, communicate the right message to your followers. You know, if you're a, if you're a food photographer, you don't say, come and get pretty pictures. You say, you know, we're going to make your your social media buzz. We're going to get po people tagging in their friends because the pictures look that good. Mm -hmm. We're going to put bums on seats and m money in the till every single night of the week, not just on Saturdays and Sundays, because the pictures look that good. You can virtually taste them and smell them through the newsfeed. So you're selling the end solution to the business owner. Now, if you're a wedding photographer or portrait photographer, you want to think what emotional value do those images create? So if you're a wedding photographer, you talk about the emotional value of your services as, as a, a wedding photographer. So you capture every single detail um, from beginning to end, the way the bride can remember it for years to come. You capture all those important people in the family who, who they live, you know, the people that they love and care about the most. You capture it in a way that is totally, um, it's it's non-obtrusive it means they can still enjoy their day with their family and mm -hmm. friends but they're still getting all the images that they they really love you create a wedding that they can look back on and relive their day over and over again all these little things that even went on around them without them being being aware of that's captured and created in their album and they can keep flicking back forward now if you're a pet photographer you create beautiful images of your best friend that you know you can enjoy any time even when you're having the most miserable day it's crap outside you've got a crap day at work your boss has peed you off you get home you make a cup of coffee and you sit in your living room and you look at this picture of your crazy four-legged friend on the wall in your living room and it brings a smile to your face so sell the benefits of what those images do you know um you can also overcome fear with with your benefits as well so one thing I, I tell people to do is empathize straight away with people as soon as they come on your, your website. So before you start talking about the benefits, find out what your client's fees are and try and get some wording in there that empathizes. So if you have a dog, if you're a pet photographer and your clients are worried that their dog might might not be the best behaved dog in the world and I've got a crazy spring spaniel, then yeah. communicate that. Say, look, don't worry. If your dog has to be on the lead, that's fine. That can be photoshopped out. You know, we, we I work with dogs all from 
from the smallest dogs to the biggest dogs, dogs that won't sit, dogs that have loads of energy. I've never had a dog that I can't photograph. If you're a pet, you know, a, a portrait photographer, say, we understand that sometimes kids can be the worst behaved at the most inopportune of times. But don't worry, the chances are we've probably had a damn sight worse in our studio. Don't <laughs> let the chances of your kids kicking off put you off creating these beautiful memories that you can treasure for years to come. So put that in the very beginning. I always say, imagine if you're learning to drive uh, and you're going around loads of different sort of websites looking for driving instructors and they're all saying how they can help you pass your test first time you know 95 percent of their, their their people pass their test first time but if you come across another website that says we know you're going to be nervous if you've never driven before we know you're going to have a little bit of anxiety you're going to be a little bit worried about making this mistake but don't worry because everybody's like that and our our instructors are caring and patient and stuff and if you communicate that straight away you're you're leveling yourself to your visitors sort of you know you're speaking their language they're like oh that's what i want to hear i'm going to read a bit more so so try and empathize with your visitors right on the home page mm -hmm. and that that the good chance is when they read that they're going to stick about and read more uh, it, this is brilliant i love it and and really nothing more to add i just i'm so excited about the simplicity and the practicality of what it is that you're sharing jeff and and it really is unfortunately missing from so many photographers websites so this is incredible advice before we jump to the third step or big idea Amanda says, yes, my Corgi loves running up to the camera. So naughty, but a great picture isn't impossible. <laughs> and but but yeah, I mean, Jeff, you, you highlight the significance of sharing what it is that your service provides on an emotional level um, and, and, and certainly just on a very basic um, uh, what's the, the benefit, I guess, ultimately that, that this person mm -hmm. is looking for the experience, the end experience that they're looking for. And what you're talking about here is really experiential. It has nothing to do with with the photographs. A beautiful photograph is almost like a bonus, right? That's kind of expected. Yeah. The, the question is, how are we actually meeting their needs? And, and I'm, as I'm writing down here, you said both um, uh, an emotional benefit, uh, certainly a practical benefit and, and potentially even addressing when you're talking about the emotional benefit, addressing a, a fear innate to that particular service. But everything centers around an experience that you're going to deliver. You're communicating mm -hmm. the benefit of that experience to that potential client. And that's the focus here. And, and again, I think this is such wonderful, practical advice. Let's jump to the third step, if you will. So, so this this always comes across uh, as a little bit controversial. And I, and I say this. In fact, I've just put a post on social media today saying this and I say, delete your testimonial page. So if you have a, a testimonial page on your website, delete it. And the reason I say this is because if you go over to your, your whoever provides your website service and you look at the back end and you look at your statistics, uh, I did this this morning for mine and I saw that 94% 90, of my traffic comes in through my homepage and leaves through my homepage. Right, so they don't actually go on any other pages. Now, remember, people now are going like that. They've got a, a mobile phone. They like to scroll. They want all the information in one place. They don't want to be clicking around different places. It's all about the scroll. So, if you have a page which is filled with testimonials, and remember, testimonials are your clients' own amazing experiences. They're selling your service to everybody else. But if you've got lock, that locked away on a testimonial page, and only six people of people or 6% or 10% of people who visit your website are going to see that, they're not doing you any good. Your testimonials need to be on your homepage. You need to have at least half a dozen testimonials spaced out throughout your homepage. Now, if you go to other industries, you look at the marketing industry, coaching industry, hotels, car industry, you will see, even gyms, you know, health and fitness, you will see testimonials on the homepage. Quite often these testimonials are used when it comes to the pricing section because the testimonial will back up the relevance of that price. You know, the best experience I've ever had. You know, this, this gym helped me lose weight and get in shape in under 12 weeks. And on the subject of testimonials, if you're going to get a testimonial and I, you know, request a testimonial from every client that you do business with is do not just say, can you do me a testimonial? Ask them for what you want them to write. So if, say for instance, you're a headshot photographer and you help people create the perfect first impression, you can write to your client and say, hi there, uh, I was just wondering, if I know you had a great uh, um, session and you were a little bit uneasy about coming in, a little bit nervous, but you said that you felt so relaxed and now you've got a, 
a headshot that you're so proud of, you don't just have it on LinkedIn, you've actually put it on your Facebook and all your friends are commenting and saying, wow, you look absolutely amazing. When you send that over, their testimonial will come back and mirror that. If you have testimonials that just say, first class service and great photographs, that doesn't sell your benefits. So all the benefits we talked about, try and get your clients to, to back that up in a testimonial. So if you have a bride who says she was really nervous and she dreading having her photograph taken, but then you made her feel so at ease, the whole day went by smoothly, and now she's got a great set of pictures that truly are a, a great reflection of our special day, and she keeps looking at it back over and over again. Get her to say that in a testimonial, because when another bride reads that with exactly the same fears and worries, bang, she'll be connected and she'll be like, oh wow. Like that. I've just been booking a hotel, you know, and I was looking at hotels, testimonials and people going, the comfiest beds I've ever slept on and the, the breakfast was first class, best I've ever had. So that made me book that hotel. If it had just said, mm. great hotel, great service, it doesn't sell any of the benefits. But I'm looking for a comfy sleep and a really nice breakfast. So get people to get your clients to communicate what you do for them, how you've made their life better in a testimonial and then showcase those testimonials on your homepage. On the homepage, not a separate page, because as you said, yeah, people are, that's where they're spending the majority of the time, at least their first interaction with you is on that homepage. Yeah. That, that's a good reminder. Quick question here, and this, I guess, maybe shows a bit of cynicism on my part, but when it comes to testimonials, we all know it's very easy to just make up a testimony and stick a name on there. How do we, yeah. how do we share these testimonials in a way that comes off as genuine? Because if I, if I go to, for example, like TripAdvisor, and, and I search about a hotel, there are thousands of comments here and you can mm -hmm. tell they're, I mean, sure, there may be a few fake ones mixed in, but there's so many and they're written in such a, I guess, a natural way, a very raw manner yeah. that you can't help but trust that this is actually somebody <clears throat> sharing their real experience. How do we make yeah. sure that it comes off as genuine? So what I do is, uh, so I've got three different, three different bits of advice towards a testimonial. So the first one is always next to every testimonial you, you use, put five gold stars because we become infatuated with gold stars. You know, thanks to Amazon, we now look at something for ages and go, hang on, this has got 4.7, this one's got 4.2. You know, 10 years ago, we'd be happy with three gold stars. But get those five gold stars next to every testimonial. Put the person's full name, so their first name and their surname and the geographical location, so you could put town and then county. If it is a commercial, um, a commercial company, if you've done a commercial shoot for somebody, then include that company's logo and then put the person's job title and the company. So, you know, Jim's McAlpine CEO of, and then the name of the company. Now, if it's a wedding, if you're a wedding photographer, why not put the bride and groom's name and the location they were, they were married? So if it was, you know, Mafton Hall or, or you know, Holmesley Great Manor, put that in there because other brides will go, oh, she's been married at the same location I'm looking at getting married, and have a picture of the bride and groom outside the front of that, that wedding venue next to that testimonial. So people can say, ah, oh, right, yeah, that's our yeah. venue. So that, that, that's a great way, you know, include names, include pictures, use those five stars as well, because people are looking for those five stars. We all, subconsciously, we're looking for that on everything we do now because of likes of TripAdvisor and, yeah. and Amazon. But the specificity that that helps encourage the sense of genuineness too that makes sense okay so steps toward increasing conversion of visitors to customers on our website first of all start with a singular purpose and of course the backup purpose that we that you described yeah. second is to communicate the benefit of the service that that is that you're offering number three delete the testimonials page or put another way uh, focus the primary content on the home page, understanding that, of course, that that's where most of these visitors are going to spend their first uh, interaction with us. Take us to the fourth point, if you will. So he's another one that always flings a spanner in the works is put your prices on your website. So um, lots of photographers go, oh, no, no, I don't want to put my price on my website. I don't want my customer, my competitors knowing um, what I'm charging or I've been told that if I don't have a price on my website then I can drive people to to get in touch and then I can upsell them when they come on the phone now if somebody has a budget of $200 and you're selling your service or your package for $500 or even $1,000 it's not the price that's going to put somebody off it's your brand if your branding isn't high-end if it doesn't look premium then it doesn't matter what your price is Right? because cheap can still be 
um, expensive, where expensive can still can be really good value for many. People don't buy on price. If people bought on price alone, Jaguar, Mercedes, Tiffany's, Ralph Lauren, Hilton Hotels, all these, all these big brands would vanish overnight and we'd just be left with the budget brands. But people don't buy on price. People buy on perceived value. So if you're worried about having your prices on your website, have a, a qualifier price, a starter price. So what you want to do is you want to have a really high-end, expensive looking brand that lifts the perceived value of the products and services you have and then have a firm price. So our wedding packages start from £2,500 or our, our, our wedding album packages start from $5,000. That is a pre-qualifier price. So that means when somebody gets in touch, somebody hits that schedule a consultation call with you, they're pre-qualified to your cheapest package. What it does do as well is it weeds out the tire kickers and the freebie hunters. If you're offering a consultation, you don't want to be jumping on a half hour consultation for somebody to turn around and say, oh, we only have a budget of $300 when your wedding packages start at $3,000. So put your prices on your website and think about it from your own perspective. How annoying is it for you as a consumer when you go to a website and you can't see any indication of price whatsoever? It's the I, first I hate thing it. we're looking for. You know, yeah, it, if so I have to email or call somebody to get at, at least a ballpark price, that mm -hmm. is so frustrating. It's so annoying. I'm moving on to the next thing because I want to. It, it's amazing, actually, to me, as, as you know, easy access as we have to software as a service now for the sake of entrepreneurs building businesses, photography businesses or otherwise. A lot of these solutions, you go to their site and, and they require you to schedule a demonstration or schedule a call in order to at least have a base, a, a ballpark figure. And yeah. as somebody, as especially a sole proprietor or a smaller business owner, if you're trying to build a business, you want to at least have some idea of what it is that you may be getting into in order to determine whether or not to continue to spend time there. It's so frustrating. And, and, and I understand the flip side of the, the, the argument, maybe uh, mm -hmm. from the standpoint of those brands as well. If, if we actually have the opportunity to have a conversation, then there's maybe a higher likelihood of conversion. But how would you respond to somebody like that? But if your brand doesn't ooze that premium feel, um, it, it's not that price that's going to put somebody off. It's the brand. You, people buy on perceived value. People buy on the external packaging. Here in the UK, we have um, um, supermarkets do a thing called a best of range. So you usually see them at the end of the aisles. And, it's, and these these are like um, meals in really nice, attractive packaging. And it's simply the best or our premier range. And you'll notice that these these meals are beautifully packaged. They use scripted fonts. Uh, quite often the wording is in gold or silver or platinum or purple because these colors are associated with um, luxury and prestige. And it's, it's a known fact that these are the most profitable items for supermarkets. It makes them an absolute fortune. But people buy on the perceived value. They're not buying the product inside, they buy the package. And they go, oh, well, that looks nice. It's effectively the same cheesecake as the cheap one. It's just a little bit deeper and they put some, some chocolate swirls on the top and put it in a different box and then sprinkle some vanilla essence on. It's, it's the perceived value, you see, it's the packaging and going back to that, you know, the, you know, a lot of the big premium brands, it's how they perceive it, how they package themselves. And you've got to remember that quite often a cheap price can put people off because people believe a premium brand and a premium price means first class quality and first class service. If you have a budget price and a premium brand, people might think, oh, hang on a minute, what's the matter with that? Why is it so cheap? Yeah, it looks so, so you have to have, the idea is to have a brand that looks really, really premium, but have a price that's just, mm. you know, above sort of mid range, you know, so that people go, oh, oh, it looks really good. And it's not as expensive as I first thought. So it's the key to get that branding right. The branding will ultimately make you more money than anything else. And it's one of the big things that's massively overlooked by photographers. All right, well, we've covered these first four points now. You're, you're left, <clears throat> you left me curious, Jeff. What is, what is the fifth big idea that's gonna help improve conversion? <clears throat> so this is one thing that um, a lot of photographers don't do and forget about, and th this is blogging. And a, a lot of photographers will be rolling their eyes when I start talking about blogging, but um, a blog is your ticket to other types of clients. So what you've got to understand is there's two types of search in, search intent. There's direct search intent and indirect search intent. 
So with my own website, thephotographersmentor.com, if you go there, I am trying to target people with my SEO um, using, you know, th this is people who are, who are looking for a photography mentor. So they've gone over to Google and they've typed in photography mentor and photography business advice, uh, photography mentors in the UK. So that is what you call direct search intent. These are people who want a photography mentor and they want one now. They've established what they want. Now, my indirect search intent comes from my blog. And that is where I'm looking at people who have a problem, a fear, and I'm giving them a solution to it through my blog. So these people are typing into Google, how much should I charge for my wedding photography? How to set up a um, photography Facebook page? Uh, how to be a photographer on LinkedIn? So think about your niche. If you're a, a wedding photographer, your brides might be typing in uh, wedding photographer, New York, wedding photographer, Manchester. So that's a direct search. However, that is brides who are already looking for a wedding photographer. Remember, you've got people who, were, who have just been engaged today. They haven't, got their, they haven't got their venue. They haven't got the dress. So the girl is going over or the man's going over, looking on the website, going um, wedding trends for 2023. Uh, in trend dresses for 2023 best wedding locations in London so what you need to do is you need to start utilizing your blog is not something that talks about you in the shoots that you've done give them the information your blog shows you as um, an authority you are uh, it, it's it's a it's a a hub of everything wedding wise if you're a, w a wedding photographer mm -hmm. and then you're starting to get people over you building that trust and you're building that relationship with them yeah. because they're right at the very beginning of the journey so that when they come to look at a photographer they're oh hang on a minute there's that photographer who's always writing helpful tips and advice and sharing blogs why don't we check out him because you, they've built that relationship and they've built that trust so there's lots of people already searching for that sort of information on google five six months down the line before they're ready to make a purchase so you start building relationships with these people so when they start typing in wedding photographer they're already thinking about you and is there is there a particular tool or resource that you'd recommend for i guess coming up with a list of key phrases <clears throat> or words that somebody would search in order to then help determine what blog posts to write yes there's lots of there's lots of um there's lots of different types of blog software. But one of the first things you can do is actually just head over to Google itself and type in a particular question. So if you type in, um, you know, how soon should I book my wedding photographer or how much is wedding photography in a particular area or how long will I have to wait for my wedding album? And then you scroll down about a third of the way down the page, you will see people also searched for and Google will give you about five or six different questions. Then if you, um, scroll right down to the very bottom of the page, you will also see, see that um, uh, relative or related searches. So similar searches with different sort of keywords in there. So that's the first place to go. Another place to go is uh, Surfer SEO. So Surfer SEO is a great place for giving you ideas for, for um, um, blog content. You've also got uh, Uber Suggest by Neil Patel. That's mm. a great uh, a great site so he will actually you can type something in it will tell you whether it has a low or a high search volume and how competitive it, it how competitive that that search term is so what you want is something with relatively high search medium to high search content but low competition and that and those are the key phrases you want to be writing blogs about and there's another one called the hof which is h-o-t-h that's another free free one and that will give you keywords and key search terms as well that people are looking for and that's spelled how again uh h-o-t-h h-o-t-h -H. H -H. Oh, okay got it yeah. perfect well we'll make sure to link to all of these in the show notes to at bocapodcast.com for those of you that are listening in and watching there's been a lot of resources shared jeff mm -hmm. and i really appreciate mm -hmm. you um, sharing not only the resources, but ultimately these points as well, these talking points. And of course, we're also just scratching the surface. Um, you've been a wonderful teacher today, a very practical teacher, and, and I really want the opportunity to like, highlight the mentoring and coaching that you offer. You mentioned to me be beforehand, we'll pull your website up here, but thephotographersuite.com. Can you just briefly summarize for our listeners the value proposition, uh, the service yeah. that you offer, <clears throat> the experience that you offer there? 
So, so I've got two different businesses. So I've got Jeff Brown, the photographer's mentor, which is me, where I do one-to-one -one mentoring with photographers in over 20 countries worldwide. And that is everything from your branding to your LinkedIn, your pricing, your website, social media, joint ventures, passive income. We go through everything together. Uh, all the details are on my website. And then uh, I've got another company called um, The Photographer's Suite, which, uh, which I set up last year. And basically that takes everything that I've talked about and create what I call scroll to a sale websites for photographers. So we've already done it for you. So we build a website for you, but in what I call a scroll to a sale format. So we, we tell you where to put the text. So we, we, we build it out. We, we put the text in there for you. Um, and it, it's basically educating photographers to build websites that convert customers, uh, visitors into customers. And I've also written a book on it called help my photography website needs more customers. So you can either do it yourself by grabbing a copy of the book or you can get us to do it for you from the photographer suite. That's great. Well, and I was just popping that up on screen for those that are live streaming. You of course saw that. We'll link to both of these in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. Jeff, seriously, this has been wonderfully practical. That, that's really the primary goal of this, this show is to offer practical, actionable advice to help photographers build sustainable businesses. And this is a key component of that. So. Thank you so much for making time for all of us. Really appreciate it. Thanks everybody for listening in and commenting. And of course, we'll link to all these resources again in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. Thanks again, Jeff. Thanks again.